Preventive health care gets a bad rap in veterinary medicine. And I think preventive health care gets a bad rap because this is probably the sort of reaction that most of us give if we're honest when we think about preventive health care. We don't actually get engaged well with preventive health care. We need to do a little bit better. If we want to get better results with preventive health care, we have to change our mindset. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data from studies that have been done that have looked at preventive health care and how we manage that in small animal practice and areas where clearly we could do better. So to provide effective preventive health care to cats, we need to have the cats coming into the clinic in the first place. So creating cat-friendly clinics, creating an environment that is less stressful for cats, sort of things that were uh, on show upstairs that you'll have all had a chance to look at. These are incredibly important things. So we need to get the cats into the clinic in the first place, but then we need to develop a lifelong partnership of care to provide for the long-term health and welfare of those cats. And when we talk about preventive health care, we often think purely about perhaps vaccinations and parasite control, but true preventive health care goes beyond that. True preventive health care actually encompasses three quite separate areas. Prevention of disease, so true prevention, the vaccinations, the prophylactic parasite control that we might use, but also prevention or preventive health care involves early detection of disease, and it also involves reducing the impact of disease. So all three of these aspects form part of what we should be thinking of whenever we talk about preventive health care. So it's perhaps a broader topic than we often think about. How well do we do with preventive health care? Well, up until recently, there'd actually been very little good data published about preventive health care, both in dogs and cats, in veterinary practice. I want to show you a couple of studies. One is uh, some data from the Bayer Veterinary Care Usage Study that was published in the States a few years ago uh, based on some focus groups and uh, some data that Bayer collected in North America. And I also want to show you results of a study that was published in Journal of Small Animal Practice a few years ago. Firstly, in terms of that Bayer study, and this is North American data, but it seems to be true in many other parts of the world as well, certainly in much of Western Europe as well. Less than 50% of owned pet cats have an annual wellness examination. Less than 50%. So already we can see that there is a big gap there that needs to be bridged. In terms of owner's perception of what is going on with preventive health care, more than 40% of owners said that they wouldn't take their cat to the vet for an annual visit unless they thought vaccinations were needed. So if vaccinations weren't needed, they wouldn't bother with an annual exam. More than 30% of owners also, interestingly, simply thought that the vet wasn't recommending an annual exam. So whatever communication was going on during that visit to the clinic, the owner was walking out thinking that the vet hadn't actually recommended that they come back in a year's time. And as far as the veterinary surgeon involved in this is concerned, more than 65% of vets thought that owners didn't value the annual exam. So you can see from that data that Bayer collected in the States, there's a big mismatch here. And most of this is about communication. There was a study that was done and published in Journal of Small Animal Practice a few years ago. This is a study that was done in Belgium. It was a study that was actually funded by Hills. They wanted to look at preventive health care health screening 
of dogs and cats, opportunities to improve the health care of dogs and cats. They involved 350 clinics in Belgium. So this was dogs and cats. Just going to show you some data from the cat part of this. This was over two and a quarter thousand cats that were examined. So this is a big data set. Now, these clinics were asked to invite owners that were registered on their practice database to bring their dog or cat in for a free consultation. So there was no cost involved for the owner. They were invited to come in, and these cats and dogs then had a standard clinical examination, a free health check, uh, checking vaccination status, checking parasite control status, looking at body condition score, looking at diet, doing a full physical examination, et cetera, and then looking at what recommendations were made based on those findings. And this is interesting. So I'm going to show you a few of those findings. So first of all, those cats that were identified as being overweight or obese. So all of these cats that were examined had a body condition score performed those cats that had a body condition score greater than five out of nine. Turns out in the study that well over a third, 36% of the cats were overweight or obese. What's interesting is what was done with those cats. So for the owners of those cats that were overweight or obese, less than a quarter of those owners were given any sort of advice about the body weight of the cat, and none of them were given any treatment. None of them were given any dietary recommendations or any diet to go home with. And you might say to me, yeah, that's okay, but that's not a good example, Andy, because we all know that when we're in a clinic and we're faced with an obese dog or cat, it's difficult sometimes to talk about obesity for all sorts of reasons. That may not be the best example. So what about some other common things then? What about microchipping, flea control, vaccination, worming? How did they perform with those things? Well, 86% of the cats were not microchipped. Of those cats that were not microchipped, advice was given to only 1% of the owners. None of the cats received a microchip. When it came to flea control, over two-thirds of the cats were identified as being or having less than optimum flea control. Only 12% of the owners were given any advice on that, none of them given any treatment. 45% of cats identified were in need of worming. Only a third of the owners given any advice about worming. Again, none of them given any treatment to go home with or follow-up appointment. And when it comes to vaccination, nearly 60% were identified as being out of date with vaccination. Again, only 31% of those owners given any advice. And just a handful of them actually given vaccination at the time or given an appointment, a subsequent appointment for the cat to be vaccinated. So there are huge opportunities here, and these were cats coming in for a free consultation, but despite it being a free consultation, the vets were still not engaging with the owners. So less than 30% of owners of cats where a problem was identified were given any advice, and way less than 1% were given any treatment at the time or follow-up appointment to address the gaps in healthcare that were identified. This gives some sort of idea of the big gap that there is in preventive healthcare in general practice. This is a small study that was done in the UK uh, last year, in fact, survey of 100 UK clinics. The clinics were asked, would cats, would older cats, senior cats, would they benefit from having blood pressure checked during a healthcare examination? And the second question following on from that was, do you routinely offer blood pressure monitoring to senior cats? Well, 88% of those clinics said, yes, it's a good idea. Not sure what the other 12% were thinking. 
but at least most of them thought it was a good idea to measure blood pressure in older cats, but only 18% of them were actually offering it routinely to older cats. Again, just not engaging well with a simple preventive healthcare measure. This was a study that was published by uh, Zoe Belshaw. Zoe Belshaw was a PhD student at University of Nottingham, and she's done some work on preventive healthcare consultations taking place in the UK. So she's published quite a few studies. I'll show you a few bits and pieces from the different studies that have been published. This was one just looking at uh, the perspective of owners and veterinary surgeons about the role of nurses and receptionists in providing preventive health care advice. Try to look at whose role it is to provide owners with information about preventive health care. Uh, and this study was interesting, a little bit depressing though, because not only were owners confused about who they could turn to for advice about preventive health care, the veterinary surgeons themselves were confused about what the role of their own staff, their own nurses and their own receptionists was in providing advice on preventive health care. There wasn't a clear policy within the practices about who was going to give advice and what sort of advice was going to be given. Perhaps worse than that, there were clearly gaps identified in, in training for veterinary nurses in particular, but also receptionists, and in a few clinics where veterinary nurses were allowed to get involved and conduct some preventive healthcare consultations, most of those clinics never charged the owners for anything that a veterinary nurse did. Now, I'm not a veterinary nurse, but in the UK at least, veterinary nurse is a profession. They are qualified individuals, and they are not being valued. If we don't value them ourselves within the clinic, how are we supposed to expect owners to value the advice that they give? It gives an indication, I think, again, of where some of the problems are. So Zoe Belshaw has published a, a few different studies from some interviews that she has conducted with a group of vets from a number of different clinics, 12 different clinics, and a group of owners as well who visited these clinics with their dogs or cats for a preventive health care consultation. This was one of the studies that she published last year. Owners and veterinary surgeons in the UK disagree about what should happen during a small animal vaccination consult. So from the veterinary perspective, she found out from these clinics at least that she looked at, the vets didn't use any sort of checklist. So what happened in a vaccine consultation was entirely down to the individual veterinary surgeon in that individual clinic. There was no standardization of what went on. Mostly the Vaccine consults were seen to be a quick and routine procedure by the vets. They were time limited. Vets often felt they were under pressure to get through these consults fairly quickly. Interestingly, no information was ever given to owners about what they should expect from an annual visit, a vaccination check or a wellness check. From the owners who went through these consultations, from the owner's perspective, vaccination was the main motivator for them to go to the clinic. Along with vaccination, they expected their pet generally to have a health check and to receive advice on any problems that were identified. But again, the owners said they were given no information whatsoever what to expect during one of these routine checks. Interesting, isn't it? We're not communicating well with our owners to tell them what they can expect, what should be going on during that process. This was another study 
Again, by the same group from University of Nottingham. It's, uh, it's a long title. This must rank as one of the longest titles of a paper, I think, published in recent years in the veterinary press. But um, this is looking again about the time allocated to preventive healthcare consultations, views from owners and views from vets that were involved. From the veterinary perspective, vets felt they were under pressure to keep to time, that time for routine healthcare consultations is limited. If it's a first vaccination, vets may get 20 minutes to do that, but if it's subsequent vaccinations, booster vaccinations, usually it's only a 10 minute time slot allocated. Vets felt under pressure to discuss with owners any problems that, I, that they identified during that consultation. It may only be a 10 minute consultation, but they felt anything that, that they identified they needed to convey to the owner during that short period of time. Vets weren't sure about how to educate owners or what level they should be trying to educate owners about preventive health care. From the owner perspective, a lot of the owners felt that these consultations had too little time or were too rushed, perhaps not surprisingly. Even the owners themselves felt under pressure sometimes because they were aware that there was a waiting room full of owners of other pets waiting to see the vet. And so the owner felt that they were under pressure not to delay things, not to ask too many questions. It's an interesting perspective, isn't it? Looking at things from the owner's point of view. Because of this time pressure, many of the owners turned to other sources of information to find out about preventive health care, turning to the internet or uh, breeders or other sources of information. Owners, interestingly, would like to use a question list. Many of these owners volunteered that they would like to use a question list. They would like to have things written down to remind them of things that they want to discuss with the vet during the consultation. And the owners would be perfectly happy to have a follow-up consultation with a nurse or to talk to the receptionist on the way out if the vet told them to do that. They would be perfectly happy to come back for another appointment if it was to discuss a particular problem that was identified. From an owner perspective, they're not worried about getting everything done during that time period. And another study, just finally, to look at this. Motivators and barriers for dog and cat owners using preventive medicines. There are things that positively impact owners, the things that really positively impact owners are the relationship with the clinic. If the owner has a really good relationship with the clinic, they trust the clinic, they're much more likely to get on board with recommendations. If they've seen adverts or press reports about specific diseases, that will ring a bell with them. They're more likely to get on board with, for example, flea control or worm control. If they've received advice from a breeder, that may influence them positively as well. Seeing animals that are suffering as a result of inappropriate health care, that all has a positive effect. Negative effects for owners, the concept of adverse effects of medications. We don't often sit and talk to owners about adverse effects of medications. Owners are often worried about the genuine necessity for medications that we give, whether that's a vaccination, parasite control, something else. Again, these are things we need to be aware of, things that we should be open to discussing with owners. Owners get confused about conflicting advice as well. That has a negative impact on their likelihood to use preventive health care medications. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Vets are uncertain, owners are uncertain, and there are concerns that owners have, and there are concerns that vets have as well. And as a profession, we don't like to think that we're being perceived as just selling stuff to owners as well. That can be a concern for us. 
But what all of this data shows us is that there is a real disconnect. And the disconnect fundamentally is about communication. The expectations of owners are very different from our expectations. But a lot of that is because we are not putting appropriate time and thought into the way that we approach preventive health care. So I just want to look very briefly at some of the opportunities for preventive health care. This was a, a study that was published looking at eight small animal clinics in the UK, looking at over uh, 1,900 patients that were examined over a 16-week period. So this was a mixture of dogs, cats, and rabbits that attended these different clinics. But the thing I wanted to highlight here was that over a third of the consultations that took place in these clinics were around preventive health care, vaccination and wellness checks. There is a huge opportunity because a lot of the consultations that we are involved in center around preventive health care. We don't give it the justice that it deserves. This is a study from Australia. They looked at cats, dogs and cats that were coming into the clinic and on the basis of physical examination, they simply identified those dogs and cats that had some other disease present on physical examination. They found that 50% of the cats that were coming in vac for vaccination had an identifiable disease. More prevalent in older cats, they graded the diseases into one, two, and three based on severity. But the point here is simply on the basis of physical examination, half of the cats were identified as having clinical problems that ought to be addressed. This was a survey, a European survey from five different European countries looking at owners and the parasite control that was taking place in cats. Two and a half thousand cats, 500 from each of these five countries. The risk factors for parasites were looked at based on the cat lifestyle, based on the risk of human exposure to parasites as well. And the cats were allocated different groups, A, B, C, and D, according to SCAP rec recommendations. And SCAP have recommendations for frequency of worming, depending on the risk factors, the category of risk that those cats are placed in. And essentially what this data shows you is that the vast majority of cats are not receiving appropriate parasite control. There is a gap in the parasite control according to international standards that are published. We're not meeting preventive health care the way we should be. This was a study by Dominic Pape at University of Ghent. This was a really nice study published five or six years ago in Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. She looked at 100 cats, 100 cats over six years of age, that as far as the owners were concerned were completely healthy. And these cats were taken to the clinic at University of Ghent, 12 hour fast, and then they were given a standardized clinical examination, had blood pressure done, they had Schirmer tear test done, they had blood and urine samples collected as well. As far as the owners were concerned, these cats had no problems whatsoever. 100 healthy cats. I'm not going to show you all the findings, these are some of the findings. 8% of them had high blood pressure, 11% had low body condition score, were underweight. 40% had a high body condition score, overweight or obese. 11% had heart murmur on auscultation. 3% had high serum thyroxine concentration. 29% elevated serum creatinine concentration. 2% had dry eye based on Schirmer tear test. 100 healthy cats, as far as the owners were concerned, over six years of age, and these are the sort of problems that were identified. A study from Australia, looking at 130 healthy cats 
attending a veterinary clinic, again, as far as the owners were concerned, completely healthy cats, six to nine years of age, so kind of middle-aged cats. All of these cats had blood and urine samples collected. Won't go through the details of the study, but essentially almost 20%, nearly one in five of these cats had significant disease identified on the basis of the blood and urine tests, or there was a significant abnormality that would at least warrant follow-up, testing and investigation. Hypothyroidism. Study again published in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery from the University of Bristol looking at 140 cats that were referred to them for treatment of hypothyroidism, radioactive treatment of hypothyroidism. The interesting thing about these cats is that nearly a quarter of them were diagnosed at routine examination, not because the owners had noticed any particular clinical signs of disease. opportunities to diagnose diseases where we may get opportunity for early intervention, reducing the impact of disease, reducing the severity of disease. This was a study again from JFMS looking at a, a, a large cohort of cats with chronic kidney disease. Over 10% of them, again, were diagnosed at routine consultation, not because the owners had identified any particular sign of clinical disease. And what we do in terms of preventive healthcare doesn't necessarily have to be complex, doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. Another study on diagnosis of CKD that was published in Journal of, uh, Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine, looking at a cohort of cats where CKD was diagnosed and looking at the change in the weight of these cats. What this study is essentially showed that in the year before a diagnosis of CKD was made, on average, these cats lost 10% of their body weight. Now imagine if those cats were being seen perhaps twice a year for routine wellness examinations, and those cats were having their body weight monitored every six months. It would have been possible to see that there was a decline in body weight doesn't necessarily mean that there's CKD in those cats, but we would be able to identify a decline in body weight simply by monitoring their body weight and know that we should be looking a little bit further at potential underlying disease. Again, measuring urine-specific gravity is a very inexpensive thing to do, but gives us a lot of information. Another study published, again, in Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery, looking at the value simply of urine-specific gravity, looking at what it means to have a low urine-specific gravity. And in that study, essentially, if you're an older cat, if you're a cat over around nine years of age, if your urine-specific gravity was less than 1035, still a roughly 50% chance of being able to identify an underlying medical cause for that low urine-specific gravity. So again, a simple, cheap thing to do. Measure urine-specific gravity as part of a preventive healthcare wellness check. If the urine-specific specific gravity is less than 1035, if it's an older cat in particular, well worthwhile doing further investigations because the chances are you may find an underlying disease. Hypertension. Lots of studies now being published on the prevalence of hypertension. And we would expect probably about 10% of cats over six to nine years of age to have systemic hypertension. If we don't measure blood pressure, we're not gonna be able to identify those cats. So, there's lots of data out there, lots of data that show that we are not doing preventive health care well, lots of data that show that there are huge opportunities. If we get engaged with it properly, there are huge opportunities for preventive health care. There are a number of things that we need to have in place to do preventive health care well. The first thing I would suggest is motivation. And by that, I don't just mean motivation of owners. 
I mean motivation of ourselves. If we are not interested in doing good preventive health care, if we're not interested in maintaining the welfare of the pets under our care, then we're never going to get anywhere with this. It's something that we have got to believe is well worthwhile doing. So we have to understand where we are not doing things well, and we have to understand the value in doing things much better. We've got to find ways of making this engaging, engaging for owners, so that we establish a really good dialogue with owners, that they are involved in the health care of their cat as well. And we've got to provide resources as well. We've got to provide resources in terms of perhaps a blueprint for what we would want for preventive health care, but also resources that enable us to engage better with owners. And I think fundamental to this, as I've already mentioned, is communication. We are so used to the find it and fix it type consultation. You know, as a profession, we like to be able to make a diagnosis. We like to be able to talk to owners about gold standard treatments and how we're going to manage their pet. And there are some fantastic things that we're able to do through that. But we have to have a different approach when it comes to preventive health care. Owners are choosing whether or not they're going to bring their cat or their dog into your clinic to have an annual exam or a biannual exam. And unless we're engaging well with those owners, we are not going to be able to provide good preventive health care. So this, I think, is about empathetic consultation process. So we shouldn't be thinking about compliance. We shouldn't be thinking about ways that we can make sure that an owner is going to do what we tell them to do. Rather, and there's a huge body of data in human medicine about this, rather, we should be looking at concordance, or what it's sometimes been referred to in, in veterinary medicine as adherence. But concordance really talks about the owner being involved in the decision-making process. So together with the owner, we agree what the problems are, why they've come in, why they have brought their cat into the clinic. If it's pr for a preventive healthcare check, then maybe we just sit down to begin with and say, okay, this is what we're going to do as part of this preventive healthcare check. Just so you understand, these are the things I'm going to go through with you. So owners get involved in the process and they get involved in making decisions about the treatment or what investigations are going to be done. We might talk to them about a, what a gold standard preventive health care program would be, what in an ideal world we would do for your cat in its life stage right now, what would be the best things we could do, and then involve them in the decision to work out what they want to do. Do they want to have blood tests done? Do they want to have a urinalysis done? Just involve them in a decision-making process. And that is a simple shift, but it's a fundamental one. If the owner is involved, if they are a part of the decision-making process, if they are given sufficient information to feel that they are a partner in this healthcare, then we will get way better outcomes. And that's been proven time and time again in human medicine. So it's a bit of a paradigm shift. And it's a different way of approaching things, and we can't do that in a 10-minute consultation. But given the fact that more than a third of the consults that we get engaged with are often about preventive health care, isn't it worthwhile taking that time to change our approach and being able to engage with the owners in a completely new way? Quote from John Maxwell, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that is so true particularly when it comes to preventive health care. Again, from human medicine, 
it is so well recognized, so many good studies confirm having checklists, having sheets that prompt owners or clients about the questions that they might want to ask. The, these might be questionnaires that the owner fills out before they come in for the consult. It might be a little checklist that they come in with because you've told them what a preventive healthcare consultation is about. You've given them a checklist perhaps of the different things that you will go through during that consult. But it also gives them an opportunity to write down any questions they've got. Because I'll guarantee you, most of your owners will walk away and have forgotten to ask you some important questions. They might go and ask the receptionist on the way out, or they might just not bother. Opportunity for engagement has been lost. Again, the time that we allocate to these consults is critical. This was a study from the US. The average length of a wellness examination was 11.3 minutes. This was a study published just last week from the UK in the veterinary record. The average length of a wellness visit in the UK, 12.4 minutes. We cannot hope to engage well with owners in that period of time. We have to be motivated to do things differently because this is important. This is about maintaining the health of their pet. This is about identifying disease at an early stage before it's well established. This is about intervening to slow down the progression of disease. These are important things. And as you all know, as the cat gets older, diseases become more common, it is so much more important that we are engaging. But even from a young age, still we're going to have opportunities to identify disease, to provide education, advice about behavior, improving the welfare of the animal. So this is what Cat Care for Life, this is a new program from International Society of Feline Medicine and International Cat Care. Cat Care for Life is about trying to reinvigorate this preventive health care concept, a program that's providing resources that will help to engage that partnership of care between the owner, the veterinary clinic, and the cat, creating the possibility of genuine engagement in providing health care. We've defined cat life stages. We did this a number of years ago, in fact, as a charity. These life stages have been widely adopted. They're based on behavioral development, physical development, and also knowledge of development of diseases in older cats. So we've got six different life stages. We used to talk about geriatric cats over 15 years of age. We don't talk about geriatric cats anymore. We talk about super senior cats. The reason for that? If you tell an owner that they have a geriatric cat, the owners turn off almost immediately because the owner thinks, my cat isn't geriatric. It might be old, but it's not geriatric. And if we want to engage with owners, we need to use language that resonates with them. So I've got an 18-year-old cat at home, a hypothyroid cat on medication for his hypothyroidism. He's not a geriatric cat, he's a super senior cat. And he is a super senior cat. But it's simple things that allow us to engage better with owners. We are looking at preventive health care across all of those life stages, taking into account all sorts of different aspects of preventive health care. We have very good data. There are many guidelines that have been published looking at prevalence of disease at different life stages. We've got good facts and figures now based on epidemiological data, when we should be intervening and looking at the possibility of different diseases. So we can come up with good recommendations. And that's part of this program, to develop a blueprint to say, at different life stages, these are the different things that you might want to think about doing. 
So measuring thyroxin, for example, uh, in a serum sample, that's going to become important at a certain age, perhaps for senior cats and above. Measuring blood pressure for the possibility of hypertension, etc. So we know when cats reach certain ages, we should be doing some things differently. But we can develop this kind of blueprint for preventive health care. But the important thing is that we have some sort of standard against which we're working against. It's really not much good having every vet in a clinic doing something different with a vaccination consult. We need some policies in place to say, what are we trying to achieve with preventive health care? How are we going to achieve it? This program helps to provide information resources, information and resources for vets, but also information and resources for owners so that the owners can get actively involved with the program as well. It's based around a website. There will be a smart app as well for owners. I'm running out of time here, but there is a lot of information based both at owners and also at vets. It's provided completely free of charge. There are other resources for preventive health care as well. This is not the only one out there, but it's one that's been launched last year and will be developed over a period of time. I'd encourage you to go and have a look at those resources. But most of all, what I really want you to do is to think about taking preventive health care seriously. There is so much opportunity for developing a meaningful relationship with the owners that bring their cats into your clinic. It takes time and it takes effort, but the rewards are enormous. I think preventive health care really defines the partnership of care that we have with owners as veterinary surgeons, as owners of clinics, and our feline patients we can do a lot better than we've done in the past and I hope you will join us on a journey of trying to achieve that. Thank you very much.